morning, everybody. Um, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Dory Lamb to uh, Yale Grand Rounds. Uh, I've known Dory uh, pretty much uh, over 20 years since my fellowship, and I, I would consider her one of the giants in urological research and in urology in general. Uh, she's run the reproductive lab at Baylor uh, for many, many years in basic science and also ran a clinical lab and has interfaced with uh, or, or controlled Dr. Lipschultz for most of his career. And um, she really, she's, she's a giant in male reproductive medicine, but she's trained an incredible number of fellows and has branched off into prostate cancer, birth defects, things like that and uh, steroid action. And she's really an incredible leader in the field of um, andrology. Uh, she switched teams about a year ago and came back to New York uh, where her roots are just like mine. So you get two New, York, two New York accents early in the morning. She's the past president of the ASRM, which is American Society of Reproductive Medicine and five other societies. Um, and she was originally scheduled to give this lecture, I think it was March 22nd, and a week before, we had a nice dinner set up um, for uh, three or four of the women in urology of whom she's mentored. I think she has a nice relationship with Leslie Rickey. And uh, a week before, she called and says, you know, I'm not allowed to travel. And we know what's happened after that. So uh, we decided to bring her back for a virtual meeting. So Dory is now professor of urology, the Dow professor of urology at Cornell Weill uh, Medical School. And she's going to talk to us about <clears throat> advanced paternal age genetics. Uh, Dr. Dean was nice enough to send me a patient yesterday who was 73. He was trying to get his 34-year-old wife pregnant. So I think it's timely uh, to have this kind of discussion. So Dory, thanks for coming and uh, welcome. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. So, so I'm going to share my screen here, I hope. As Stan said, I'm going to talk to you today about um, genetics of male infertility and advanced paternal age. And, and I'm hoping that, um, that I'm able to uh, really um, broaden your knowledge of of uh, what uh, is sort of clinical state of the art right now. So my focus is more clinical than research. Um, and, um, and I'm hoping this will be helpful, especially for the residents. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, none of these um, conflicts of interest are uh, germane to the topic of this talk. And I have learning objectives for you here, essentially, um, you know, uh, you should know the diagnostic categories of male infertility um, and who should undergo genetic evaluation and the techniques that are used to do this. Um, and then learn the types of abnormalities that are particularly common in infertile men and understand the importance of this, not only to um, sort of the care of infertile men, but also in terms of uh, what we know about advanced paternal age and um, um, for men who want to attempt uh, to achieve parenthood. So I think we all know that genetic tests evaluate chromosomal defects, uh, numerical and sex chromosomal defects, as well as structural chromosomal defects. And we're gonna go into these in um, quite a bit of detail, um, as well as uh, talk about gene deletions and uh, mutations. And so, in this slide, I'm showing you uh, the normal male carrier type. I think that you should all be very familiar with this. Um, here is a high resolution banding carrier type. That is the, uh, that's what probably you're almost used to, to seeing. Um, and this is a spectral carrier type. It's simply a more colorful way to look um, at the different chromosomes. It's particularly useful for looking at things like translocations um, and complex rearrangements such as we see in, in malignancies. So clinically, uh, either of these could be done. This type of karyotype is most normally uh, performed uh, for most patients. Um, and so you can see here we have um, karyotypes of a normal male. Uh, they have 22 pairs of autosomes and one set of sex chromosomes with the Y being male determining. Well, 
and, and forgive me if some of you are gene jocks um, um, and just hang in there because um, we're going to be um, looking um, at some more advanced genetics as well. Um, but the karyotype is really, you know, um, I think analogous to going to the encyclopedia, um, to the library and looking at the Encyclopedia Britannica. None of us go to the library too often anymore, but, but if we did, we would see that all the volumes of the encyclopedia are there um, and, and they're present in the right number. They're about the right size and thickness for whichever volume it is that we're looking at. Um, and that's analogous to looking really at all the different chromosomes. Um, and, um, you know, um, but when we look at the outside of the encyclopedia, all we cannot see whether or not we're missing chapters, we have chapters mixed between different volumes of the encyclopedia that would be analogous to having either deletions or duplications on the chromosomes or translocations with regions actually switched between different chromosomes. So it's a very superficial look at our genetic information. And if we simply do a karyotype analysis on unselected infertile men, absolutely no diagnosis at all, no semen analysis, nothing. Um, we see that infertile men um, have about a tenfold increased incidence of karyotype abnormalities as compared to proven fertile men. So about 6% of unselected infertile men have karyotype abnormalities. And you know, my lab uh, about 10 years ago uh, looked at this in more detail and tried to stratify this based on um, abnormal uh, sperm count. Um, and so uh, again, we looked at infertile men in general, um, and this included men in, um, I don't know where this went. Uh, this is uh, men with normal semen parameters, but who were infertile, so no normal zoospermia. Um, and you can see that when we plotted the incidence of men with abnormal uh, semen parameters um, based on whether or not they had numerical sex chromosome abnormalities, structural autosomal abnormalities, or structural sex chromosomal abnormalities, you can see that there was not only a much higher incidence of these types of cytogenetic anomalies um, in infertile men, and as the semen uh, count, the sperm count went down, um, we saw different kinds of abnormalities being present. Uh, the numerical sex chromosome abnormalities being most common in the men with non-obstructive azoospermia. And here we have severely oligozoospermic men. So unlike um, the, the, the NOA men, you can see that the preponderance of them had structural chromosomal abnormalities. Um, and again, a, a, a mixture sort of had the structural sex chromosomal abnormalities. But the point is that when we're looking at men with poor sperm count, uh, we see that the incidence of the percent of men who are abnormal is actually tremendously higher. Um, and so if we simply look at um, you know, uh, infertile men in general, again, um, they, they have in our hands at least about uh, an 11, 10 or 11 percent incidence. And for the non-obstructive azoospermic men, it went up uh, to about uh, 12 and a half percent. So uh, incredibly high incidence. Now, I don't want you to think that it's only the, uh, that only the infertile men that have a problem. So this was a very famous study of a thousand couples who um, sought treatment um, thinking that they were going to need ICSI, but again, they were totally undiagnosed. Um, and um, a karyotype was done on both the male and female partners of, of these infertile couples. And you can see again, about 6% of the um, unselected infertile men had a karyotype abnormality, but almost 5% of the women did as well. And women are almost never um, tested with a karyotype analysis, but clearly they should be, um, you know, based on this type of data. And there have been many other studies since uh, this publication by Gekas that have confirmed these findings. So if we simply did a karyotype analysis on all infertile couples, we could account for 11% of infertility. That is never done. 
Now, if we look a little closer at what these chromosomal defects are that are causing the male infertility for the numerical disorders, as if you remember, I showed you for non-obstructive azospermia, Klinefelter syndrome is actually the most common cause. This is the presence of an extra X or multiple X chromosomes um, resulting in non-obstructive azospermia. Uh, for the residents, uh, it's an important one for you to remember because sometimes these are board questions that you might encounter. Um, now, for the structural chromosomal defects, there can be translocations, inversions, deletions, duplications, a wide variety of different types of changes. And we're going to talk about these structural chromosomal defects in more uh, detail. In particular, we'll talk about the Robertsonian translocations, which are a major issue for men with non-obstructive azospermia and severely oligozoospermic men. <clears throat> and there can also be gene dosage changes due to microdeletions or microduplications. So these would be too small to see on a karyotype that I just showed you, but are visible on a molecular karyotype using um, some um, oligonucleotide array-based technologies. And we'll talk about Y-chromosome microdeletions as well and some other gene dosage changes. Now, structural chromosomal abnormalities, I think, have really um, not been considered widely by the urologist in the diagnosis of the infertile male, but they really should be. And that is because about four and a half percent of oligozoospermic men, and so here um, the studies were done uh, using 20 million sperm per milliliter as the cutoff. Um, so these are men with 20 million and less. Um, so nearly 5% of them have autosomal translocations and inversions. And almost 14%, again, have autosomal, um, of the non-obstructive azospermic men, have autosomal translocations and or inversions. So again, this is a high percentage. Um, in contrast, only about 1% of this should be infertile women have autosomal translocations. And when we look at the general population of fertile and infertile individuals unselected, it's about 0.16%. Uh, so you can see a very significant increase in the frequency of these structural chromosomal anomalies. And this is important because, for example, the, the men with oligozoospermia are usually never or very rarely referred to a urologist for an evaluation. Um, because, you know, in the IVF lab, they can find sperm to use um, for an assisted reproductive technology. And because the sperm are there and are somewhat functional, there's a very significant concern of transmission of the structural chromosomal abnormalities to the offspring. And the reason this is such a concern is that when you have um, homologous recombination during meiosis, right, the chromosomes come together, right, they, they cross over and then they have to segregate, um, you know, these balanced translocations can become unbalanced translocations. And that results in very serious birth defects and more commonly fetal loss. Um, so again, it would be useful for these couples to, to have genetic counseling and then to have some additional genetic analysis done during their ART procedure to try and minimize this risk. Now, um, the most important type of translocation to remember are the Robertsonian translocations. These are the most common translocations uh, that are found in, in humans. Um, and what happens is that uh, a Robertsonian translocation occurs when you have what's called an acrocentric chromosome. So that means that the chromosome has a short arm and a very long arm. And so they're not even close to being the same size on the two ends of the chromosome. Um, and so when you have homologous recombination, um, when you get a Robertsonian translocation, it occurs when you have the breakage and rejoining, but instead of um, having proper recombination, you can see that the two small fragments, right, the two short arms um, have now um, um, rejoined, whereas the two long arms rejoined. So you get individuals who have only 45 chromosomes, not 46, and, um, and they're missing this fragment 
Um, and this is the Robertsonian translocation. So this occurs most commonly um, between these chromosomes, 13, 14, 14, 15, 13, and 21, and 21 and 22. So not surprisingly, the, tr the Robertsonian translocations affecting chromosome 20, 21 can result in uh, trisomy 21, which is Down syndrome. Um, when you have the uh, abnormal uh, Robertsonian translocations between that um, involve chromosome 14, you can either get an unbalanced translocation leading to a trisomy 13, which is called PATU syndrome, which is consistent with a viable but, but affected birth. And if it's between chromosomes 14 and 15, you can get uniparental disomy, which results in imprinting disorders. Again, very severe conditions for the offspring. Now, again, remember that these Robertsonian translocations are the most common structural chromosomal abnormality. It occurs naturally in about one out of a thousand births. And there's, you know, all different types of um, conditions that you can have uh, with this Robertsonian translocation. But the most common ones are between chromosomes 13 and 14 and 14 and 21. So this accounts for 85% of all the Robertsonian translocations. Importantly, when you look at the individual who has the balanced Robertsonian translocation, so that's the 45 chromosomes that I showed you with the, just the two long arms uh, joined together. <clears throat> um, so whether it's heterologous or even um, homologous, they usually don't have an obvious phenotype. And so um, it's not until the time that they then decide to attempt to reproduce um, that, um, that anything is discovered and that they're even suspected to have this type of anomaly. Um, and again, when you have these unbalanced gametes, you have a risk of infertility, spontaneous miscarriage in the women, um, um, as well as, again, the offspring with unbalanced translocations, the uniparental disomy, or the imprinting disorders. Um, when you have a, um, an individual ha who has um, uh, homologous Robertsonian translocations, um, they can only produce abnormal gametes, whether they're males or females, and so they either have disomy or nullisomy for the chromosomes involved. Um, so again, um, in this case, it's most likely um, inconsistent with a viable birth. So just remember that infertility problems um, due to Robertsonian translocations are most commonly seen in the oligozoospermic men as well as the non-obstructive azoospermic men. In adult females, um, it usually is associated with either recurrent pregnancy loss or just infertility. And again, they can have offspring with known Robertsonian abnormalities. Whoops, we went backwards there. Um, and it's, it's important again for genetic counseling of these couples because they are at a very high risk of having either a child with an unbalanced uh, translocation or with um, recurrent pregnancy loss. So now we're gonna to move to another type of structural chromosomal defect found in infertile men that I'm sure you've probably heard about, and that is the Y chromosome microdeletions. Um, and these abnormalities were first discovered by two cytogeneticists in the, the mid 1970s. Um, and in this case, they weren't looking at microdeletions, they were looking at loss of a major part of the long arm of the Y chromosome, which I have shown for you here. And they saw that, um, that a significant percentage of men with non-obstructive azoospermia uh, had a deletion um, of a major portion of the long arm of the, the Y chromosome. And they hypothesized that there were genes required for spermatogenesis uh, in this region. And they termed this region the azoospermia factor region, or AZF. And it took about 20 years for Rene Reho working in David Page's lab um, to identify several uh, putative spermatogenesis genes in that region. Um, and uh, the one that was first described was called deleted in azoospermia or the DAS gene, uh, which again is located in this region right here. 
Today we know that um, if we're looking at, here's the long arm and the short arm of the Y chromosome, we know that the AZF region is now more complicated than what was first considered um, by, by those initial studies in David Page's lab. So the AZF region is now divided into AZF-A, AZF-B, and AZF-C, and here's the DAS gene right here in AZF-C. And again, this would be the tip of the long arm of the Y chromosome. And um, it's very important for the urologist to know which portion of the, um, the uh, Y chromosome is microdeleted in men with non-obstructive azoospermia, um, because if you have deletion of only AZFC, about 65% of those men will have rare sperm found by testicular microdissection um, during um, an ART procedure, right? So um, uh, testicular sperm extraction. But if you have a man with a deletion of AZFB and or AZFA, you will never find sperm on a testis biopsy. There are no reports in the literature that have been reproducible uh, that where men have deletions in these regions. So these men have to seek, or couples have to seek alternative paths to parenthood. Um, so again, very important to realize that people with men with uh, AZFB or AZFA deletions should not undergo testicular sperm extraction. So who should be tested for Y chromosome microdeletions? Certainly um, our practice guidelines say all non-obstructive azoospermic men, uh, as well as severely oligozoospermic men. Um, and it's important to remember that, um, you know, even for the men with the deletions in AZFC of the DAS gene, um, the Y chromosome microdeletions will be inherited by the male offspring conceived by intracytoplasmic sperm injection or ICSI. So clearly, um, you know, uh, couples need to know that, um, that the boys will be infertile like their fathers were. Um, some couples um, don't, don't care about that. You know, others do gender selection in terms of the assisted reproductive techniques that they're using. Um, and just while I'm mentioning about practice guidelines, uh, you know, the new uh, AUA ASRM practice guidelines were just posted. Um, so I, um, it, it will be important, I think, for the residents to review some of that because there were major changes in this version of the practice guidelines. Now, um, my lab showed um, a number of years ago that um, a subset of men with Y chromosome microdeletions, so these are non-obstructive azoospermic men, have a coexisting genomic syndrome. So not only do they have the Y chromosome microdeletion syndrome, they also have um, shock syndrome. So shock is a gene that encodes um, a protein involved in stature. So shock stands for short homeobox protein uh, affecting stature. And um, so when you have the loss or an extra copy of the shock gene, you have stature problems. The men are either incredibly short if they have a microdeletion of the shock gene, or if they have duplications of the shock gene, they're incredibly tall. Um, and so these are not subtle phenotypic abnormalities. The men are usually below about four foot 11 um, with a, a, a loss of one copy of the shock gene. Um, and uh, when they have extra copies, of the shocks gene, um, they're above the 95th percentile. So think of the, the big guys who are like seven feet tall, um, and uh, you know they're they're probably at risk of having an extra copy of shocks. Now, if we were medical geneticists, we would immediately be able to recognize a shocks patient just by looking at them, and that is because they have mesomelic short stature. They also have a very characteristic deformity of the wrist called the, the Madelung deformity, and they have bowed radius. And if, if the individual has, say, either the loss or uh, damaging mutations for two copies of the shocks gene, that is even more severe in terms of the phenotype, and that's called Larry Weil syndrome. And uh, if you want to think about a common sort of body habitus that is that shocks um, is described by, that would be by the Turner female, who is an XO female. And again, um, 
very obvious if you're if you're um, attuned to thinking about that and looking at at the patients. I will tell you that when we we did this study, we got um, DNAs from Y chromosome microdeleted patients from a number of urologists around the country, and uh, I had asked all of them, you know, did you ever notice that some of your patients with Y chromosome microdeletions were kind of short with these funny arms and kind of a strange body habitus? Oh, no, 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 no. But it turned out that 23% of the Y chromosome microdeleted men had shocks gene dosage changes. Um, and um, in, in their defense, you know, especially for the academics, um, you know, uh, the medical students, residents, fellows, everybody under the sun was seeing these patients. And so I think that they weren't normally standing and uh, to, to see kind of the strange body shape um, and, um, and also, um, I, I think that, um, um, you know, the gynecologist always takes a woman's height, and I think that's not commonly done during the history and physical in urology. So in any event, if you have very short patients or extremely tall patients with non-obstructive azospermia, you should immediately think that this person may have Y chromosome microdeletions. Um, certainly, you need to do the, the test. And again, remember the, this is associated with stature abnormalities. So now we're going to turn to single gene defects causing male infertility. And essentially, there are gazillions, technical term, of genes involved in male infertility. Anything that affects the steroid uh, receptor, um, the steroid hormone axis, so steroid biosynthesis, steroid metabolism, um, uh, steroid receptor um, function, co-activators, co-repressors, signaling pathway genes. Um, it's a very complex um, uh, collection of different types of abnormalities can cause male infertility. Not surprisingly, genes uh, that are defective, that encode growth factors, cytokines, their receptors, and again, genes involved in their signaling um, are associated with human male infertility. This goes also for the protein hormones and their receptors, um, as well as, not surprisingly, genes required for um, genomic integrity, control of mitosis, meiosis, um, obviously sex determination is a big one, transcription factors, many, many more. So there are many, many genes that are known to be involved in human infertility. I'm just going to mention some of the areas where we know a lot, but we're not going to talk about it in much detail. The first is congenital birth defects associated with male infertility. Now, I think you all recognize what this is. Um, this happens to be a picture of Larry Lipschultz's, um, of one of his patients with um, congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. Uh, you can see the blind ending epididymis, um, and um, this is a genital form of cystic fibrosis. And, you know, this wasn't recognized years ago. Uh, people were doing um, micro, like a, a mesa, um, to try to retreat retrieve sperm from these men to use for, with IVF before they knew that this was actually a urogenital form of cystic fibrosis. And it's important even today to realize that, you know, in the evaluation of these patients in genetic labs, medical genetics diagnostic labs, where um, they screen for cystic fibrosis carrier status, those are not the types of tests that can pick out the gene, the mutations that are involved in congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. So they can detect about 90% of carriers of the most common um, uh, mutations in the gene that's involved in cystic fibrosis, but not all mutations or variants are detected. And so if cost is an issue, then certainly the female partner should undergo carrier testing but ideally, both partners should have the gene fully sequenced, and it's, it's a big gene, um, and so it's more costly to get this done. Um, there, are, um, there are already 1,300 mutations um, that have been identified in this gene that can result in cystic fibrosis. Um, and um, 
even with this um, test being done, a small number of children born following ICSI for um, congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens are at risk of cystic fibrosis. So if we think about uh, obstructive azospermia due to CBABD, um, always think in terms of the cystic fibrosis gene, it's the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator gene. But today we know that there is a second gene involved, an X chromosome uh, gene, which is called adhes adhesion G protein coupled receptor G2 or ADGR. <laughs> Okay, I thought that was me there at first. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, so remember that there's a second gene involved. And so again, this is an important one to know in the diagnostic, um, from the diagnostic perspective of what you wanna order in the evaluation of these patients. Now, not surprisingly, uh, disorders of sex determination and differentiation are well known to be associated with male infertility. Some of these are extremely severe, um, right? If you don't get uh, proper sex determination, um, if you have problems such as an XX male um, or um, an SRY deficient male where you don't get testis determination in, in the latter case. Um, but today we also know that cryptorchidism is a well-known cause of uh, non-obstructive azospermia. It, about 65% of patients with cryptorchidism who undergo um, an orchiopexy at the proper time during um, uh, um, infanthood or um, early childhood, um, about 65% of those males will still have spermatogenic failure. Um, Hypospadias can also be associated with some of these defects. We've talked about the um, congenital absence of the vas deferens. Ambiguous genitalia, again, is a, is a genetic condition. Um, Epispadias bladder extrophy is less well understood from a uh, diagnostic perspective. But again, all of these can be associated with um, varying degrees of male infertility. Now, um, I guess about uh, 12 years ago, uh, my colleague Mar Marty Matsuk and I published um, the second of two reviews that we did for Nature Medicine um, on um, the genes involved in human uh, male and female infertility. And so in 2008, these were the genes which were known at the time to result in a variety of different types of um, uh, GU birth defects. Um, and um, nobody tests for these genes then. Um, well, today we've had an explosion in our knowledge of how many genes and what they are um, are associated with human hypospadias and cryptoarchidism. And you can see nearly a thousand genes associated with human hypospadias and 1,700 genes associated with cryptoarchidism. But only rarely is exon sequencing ordered for diagnosis. And my lab also works in this field um, from a, a research perspective. And I can assure you um, that it's amazing. And uh, many of these children are actually syndromic, which is not usually recognized by the, the pediatric urologist caring for the patient or, or the adult urologist. So anyway, but, but the important thing to say is that, you know, um, None of these patients are ever clinically diagnosed currently. Now we're going to move to some ty different types of sperm function and sperm morphology defects. And um, this is an area, again, which has been, I think, underappreciated both in the uh, IVF world, ART world, as well as by the um, practicing urologist. So I'm going to start with teratozoospermia. So here I show you one type of teratozoospermia. These are sperm with um, morphology defects. In this case, it's a defect of the head. So on the top row here, we're looking at a normal morphology um, for the head um, where you can see the sperm head. This is the acrosomes uh, staining in green. And, and you see kind of, um, it almost looks like a tennis racket, right? Um, because the sperm is kind of shaped like this, 
oval shaped. And then if, if you turn it on its side, of course, it's going to look very long and narrow, um, which again is frequently a problem with technicians trying to do strict morphology assessment. But in this case, um, the morphology defect that we're looking at is called globozoospermia. So this is round-headed sperm. And this is due to a missing acrosome. You can see right here and the round head of the sperm head in, in blue. Um, and here, the other type of globozoospermia is due to an, uh, a misplaced acrosome or an atrophied acrosome. And, and this sperm has uh, both, both problems, actually. Um, but when you have this, the sperm cannot penetrate the egg investments and achieve fertilization because it can't get into the egg um, to even initiate the process of fertilization. And, you know, um, I know you all are not uh, probably so familiar with the um, process of, of uh, sperm differentiation during spermiogenesis um, in uh, spermatogenesis. And, um, but remember that the, um, the acrosome actually comes from the development of the Golgi, um, where you have the Golgi apparatus and you have these vesicles that are produced that then traffic and fuse to form the acrosome covering. We can think of this as like a sock-like uh, structure on the head of the sperm con um, containing hydrolytic enzymes needed, again, to penetrate the egg investments. So when you have round-headed sperm, again, you're missing uh, this acrosome right here. And so we now know that there are genes involved in a whole series of different processes required to get the formation of the acrosome. I have many of the genes listed for you here. The most common ones to remember are SPADA16, which is highly expressed in the human testis. Um, and mutations in this gene that are damaging were identified in a very significant percentage of globozoospermic men, round-headed sperm men. And there's a second gene, DPY19L2. I have no idea what that stands for, um, but, um, but the gene uh, itself um, can exhibit either gene dosage changes, so these are microdeletions or microduplications, or damaging mutations. And again, this is a common cause of globozoospermia, more particular to certain geographic and ethnic regions. But these men, again, have very severe globozoospermia with a very high percentage of abnormal sperm. So why do we care about this clinically and why should we diagnose this? And that is because the knowledge of the cause of the globozoospermia impacts patient counseling. So men with um, either deletions or mutations of DPY19L2s or SPADA16 um, have a very poor likelihood of achieving a pregnancy, even with intracytoplasmic sperm injection with egg activation, um, because even if you inject the sperm in and you um, use a calcium ionophore to get calcium influx to activate the egg, you get a very poor rate of fertilization and even embryos that are transferred either don't implant or there's an early pregnancy loss. And so there are, there are very, very few reports of a live birth uh, resulting from uh, patients uh, with this condition. And in, in this example here, the three um, out of 31 attempts in 17 men um, that had ICSI um, Two, two of these pregnancies were achieved by the same patient. All right, so, um, you know, um, but, and then there are other publications that again show this um, with larger populations. These were the initial studies. Um, there are two other genes, pick, pick one, um, as well as a, a, a variety of other genes here in the pipeline. But again, important to know whether or not the patients have these particular defects because they perhaps should go undergo genetic counseling and decide, do they want to take a chance and, and a, a very costly um, chance, right, in terms of not only the, the cost of doing um, IVF with ICSI, but also the, the emotional cost to the couple to try to achieve a pregnancy that in large part is probably not going to be successful. 
Now there's another type of morphologic defect um, that affecting uh, the head to be concerned about. And this is um, termed macrozoospermia. This is a sperm with a big head um, and frequently uh, uh, multiple tails attached to this large head. And this is due to mutations in the aurora kinase C gene. Um, and this protein is usually involved in um, the process of cytokinesis during meiosis. So remember, you have to have the chromosomes um, segregating properly and proper meiotic spindle checkpoints, um, controlling the, the segregation of these chromosomes. Um, and what happens is that you don't ever get the proper cell divisions during meiosis. So instead of getting a normal formed sperm with a haploid chromosomal complement, um, instead you don't get cytokinesis, you don't get cell division. So you end up with sperm that have a big head with four, they're polyploid. They have four copies of the genome present instead of one, which would be haploid. And they, they have multiple tails, many times four tails attached. And again, uh, there's a very common mutation of men of European and, and uh, North African origin uh, that accounts for macrozoospermia. Uh, and ICSI should not ever be performed because the chances of a normal pregnancy are really slim to none. So again, important to recognize that this is present. Now, it, for men with poor sperm motility, um, we now know a lot about these conditions. And they are now grouped into a bigger category of sperm defects. And this is multiple um, anomalies, multiple morphologic anomalies of the sperm flagella, um, or whoops, or MMAF. Um, and as you remember, um, the sperm tail right, has a whole series of structures in it that are absolutely critical for, um, for having sperm motility. This is true in the cilia, for example, in the bronchioles as well as in the sperm. And um, the structures were identified a number of years ago that we commonly see. And, and um, I think that the residents will remember that you have the, the central pair here. You have um, the um, you have the, the doublets, right, being present um, here. Um, and you have a series of different arms and bridges that connect all of this together that allow um, you to ultimately get the motor that forms to be able to drive the, the sperm motility. And so essentially mutations in any of all of these, in any of these genes which are listed for you here can result in structural defects that affect either this centriole um, um, assembly, the periaxonemal structure and the axoneme, um, and again, affecting this um, um, uh, nine plus two, right? Remember you have the nine pairs of doublets plus the two central ones, um, the pairs of microtubules, the fibrous sheath, right? Um, on the outside of this, as well as the inner and outer dianine arms, which again are, are um, absolutely required for getting sperm motility. So mutations in any of these genes can impact sperm motility. In fact, even we see sometimes sperm with just a little um, kink at the end of the tail. This again is a major, major sperm morphology defect resulting from some of these types of gene mutations. Now, a subset of this, some would argue a separate group, is primary ciliary dyskinesia. And this is really a true success story of next generation sequencing to improve our understanding and ability to diagnose these patients. So primary ciliary dyskinesia is usually identified because of the airway disease part of the condition. Um, it's associated with infertility, again, due to immodal sperm, and you have laterality defects, right? So you have situs and versus present, and this is due to the dual loss, in this case, of the inner dianine arms and the outer dianine arms that power the flagella and, and the cilia and the flagella beating. And so again, because there are good pedigrees of these families, both whole exome and Sanger sequencing identified a whole series of bioallelic mutations. 
And so today there are about 90 different gene defects that are known um, that again, affect the structures that we just talked about um, that are part of the sperm tail um, that um, affect either the axoneme, the inner and outer dynein arms and this regulatory complex, the central microtubule pair, the necks and links, and again, give you the problem of situs and versus. Um, but even though 90 are clinically assessed in the medical geneticists lab, there are nearly a thousand more genes that encode proteins required for these structures that are in the process of clinical validation um, to be used again for the medical diagnosis of this type of uh, spermatogenic defect. Now, in addition to primary ciliary dyskinesia, um, again, and um, disorganization of the fibrous sheath that we mentioned only very briefly, there are also um, can be defects in the ion channels, which are needed again to stimulate um, the sperm motility. Um, there's a number of these ion channels which are known. Um, and I think one of the most common that would be familiar, at least perhaps to Stan, would be uh, cat spur one or two, the cat ion channel sperm associated proteins one and two. And when you have defects in this, you get hearing disorders and deafness. Um, and so again, um, this should be um, a heads up if you have patients coming with not only sperm motility problems, but also um, a hearing deficiency. Now, again, when, when Marty and I published this paper in Nature Medicine, um, and I will tell you, we set the, 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 we set the record for uh, the length of the paper in Nature Medicine, which has not been broken yet. It's like 14 pages long. Um, on the genetic causes of human uh, male and female infertility. This was what was known, you know, uh, 12 years ago. And now we know that there are specific for non-obstructive azospermia, almost a thousand genes which are known to be associated um, with these conditions, but only the karyotype and Y chromosome microdeletion are, are used um, to diagnose these patients. And of course, if you have obstructive azospermia, then the CFTR mutation gene for cystic fibrosis. These are the only genetic tests that are routinely ordered. <clears throat> so now we're gonna switch a little bit to advanced paternal age in the last couple of minutes that I have to talk to you. Um, and um, you know, th this is an interesting story because um, you know, we all have a ticking biological clock. Women have long known this, right? Because um, they have a limit to their ability to conceive because they undergo menopause. But men are seemingly untouched by this notion of a fertility precipice. And you know, they, they consider themselves to be immune to the ravages of aging. And so this, this occurs both um, in a physiological sense with regard to their fertility, but also a societal one. And so it's always been very acceptable for older men to have much younger wives um, and, and you know, uh, have families with them. But in reality, um, scientists have been studying the effect of advanced paternal age since about 1860s. Um, and um, today there are concerns because there is a paternal age effect. And this is probably almost never discussed with older men seeking to become parents. And you know, the first report of an effect of advanced paternal age was reported in the mid um, 1860s by Dr. Wilhelm Weinberg. Um, who noticed that there was a, a problem with advanced paternal age and birth defects. And he saw this um, in the, the last born child um, in families in the town that he worked in in uh, Germany. Um, and the concept though was more clearly defined by another uh, investigator, Penrose in 1955. We still didn't have all of our knowledge of genes and so on. But, but again, they were able to see very obvious patterns. And since that time, I've listed for you here, and if anybody is interested in the data, in the literature, I can show that to you. Too many to put on the slide. There are you know, hundreds of papers um, that talk about birth defects, genetic syndromes, um, um, that are related to advanced paternal age. And in fact, in 2012, Paternal age effect disorders became a recognized diagnosis in the genetics field. And this is because there's a 
bias and the paternal origin of mutations, strong paternal age effect with a high germline mutation rate. So again, in the genetics field, this is well recognized, not in urology. Now, what are the effects of these paternal age um, problems? So first, there are increased incidence of obstetrical complications in the female partners of, of older men. There are pregnancy complications um, uh, when you control for the age of the woman. Um, this includes um, all types of intrauterine fetal uh, demise, preterm delivery, um, placental abruption, and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. It's also associated with an increased risk of uh, late stillbirth, um, low birth rate, um, preterm birth, and very preterm birth. So again, um, um, these are large studies um, um, that have uh, shown these associations. Now, if we look at um, the uh, sort of the fertility of the, the patients in general, this came from a study of a little over a thousand men uh, who were using um, in vitro fertilization to achieve a pregnancy. Um, for a variety of different uh, reasons. And you can see that um, the color codes uh, stratify these men by increasing age up to over 55 years of age. So really the, the sperm fertilized the, the oocyte just fine. Pregnancy um, can occur just fine. So the, you, know, you get implantation, you get a measurable pregnancy, but you see with an increasing paternal age, specifically above, in the, say, 50 years of age, um, you see a very significant increase in the loss of the pregnancy um, and a decrease in the live birth rate um, um, with increasing paternal age. And um, this, again, has been reproduced by several different authors. Now, why does this occur? Um, it's not clearly understood. Um, Certainly, um, paternal age has negative impacts on semen quality. So um, semen volume goes down, total sperm count goes down, motility and morphology go down with uh, paternal aging. We can see evidence of these de declines in men who are even 45 years of age, the initial steps. Um, it also, again, negatively impacts the ART outcomes. Um, and uh, you get poor embryo quality and reduction of fertilization, so less embryos to transfer. And we talked about the other issues of pregnancy and live birth rates. Um, and, and increased paternal age is associated with DNA fragmentation. Um, and it's also associated, again, with infertility and li at lower live birth rates. So again, um, all of these are associated with paternal age. Now, there were very interesting studies and um, the, the data that I'm showing you has been well validated by many other papers in the literature. And that is that when we look at the genome-wide patterns and properties of de novo mutations in humans, so these are mutations in the offspring and say, how did these arise? There was a very interesting initial study here of 250 families in Iceland, Greenland, one, one of those small areas. Um, and they found um, when they looked at the mother, the father, and the offspring, they found that in the offspring that there were about 11,000 new mutations in the offspring. When they looked at where these mutations came from, they found that it came from the paternal contribution to the offspring. And in fact, paternal age could explain 95% of the global uh, mutation rate in the entire human population. And the de novo mutations that were found were more numerous in the children of older fathers than younger fathers. If we look at these, each one of these dots are new mutations in the offspring plotted by the age of the parent of at conception, obviously the women undergo menopause, so they're gonna stop here a lot earlier than the men do. But you can see that even in the younger men, more de novo new mutations were found in the offspring and they increased significantly over time to a much greater extent than that seen in, in um, the contribution of the, the women to these de novo mutations. Now, the variability is thought to be due. Um, there's also a, uh, you see variability between families as well. So that 
implies a genetic basis for some of this. There can be variation in DNA mismatch repair genes. Um, some of this is thought to be due to the frequency of the spermatogonial divisions during mitosis um, in the testis, right, in the process of spermatogenesis. And again, there are individual differences in the rate of mutagenesis um, that, that um, actually are additive with the age effects seen. Now, when I say that um, some of these um, problems with advanced paternal age are associated with genetic conditions. Some of them are more common than others. The most common being achondroplasia, which is what our, our um, the initial observation was by uh, Wilhelm uh, Weissman. Um, and here we see that um, advanced paternal age was considered to be greater than 50. So there's about an eightfold um, increased relative risk, right, um, for um, um, the children being born from the older men uh, with achondroplasia. Um, Apert, Pfeiffer, and Cruzan syndrome are all um, interrelated. And again, you see a very significant about a, depending on this, about a tenfold increased risk of, of having a child born with that. And these numbers vary by condition and by the individual gene, with some being more commonly affected than others. But, but I think you can see that the trend is certainly there for these ones that I show you, which are an incomplete list of the many, many found in the literature. There are also increased uh, genetic syndromes and mutations in the offspring of older men. Um, and importantly, some of these are, cannot be identified on a, you know, a fetal ultrasound. Um, certainly, the, the problems of poor neurocognitive outcomes and, and behavior disorders um, are not evident, you know, from doing this type of analysis. Um, and uh, you can see that um, virtually every body part and type of uh, syndrome uh, can be in, is increased in children conceived by older men. Now, the children born to fathers greater than 40 also have increased mortality uh, within uh, the first five years of life. Um, a variety of different causes for this. Um, and this, again, is one example, but there are many of these studies using uh, registries, especially in Scandinavia, all coming to the same conclusion. So what are the recommendations for couples with advanced paternal age? So the new practice guidelines for, um, uh, for um, ACOG, um, as well as um, some of our practice guidelines in the AUA for the infertility guidelines, uh, talk about um, the need for couples um, planning to initiate a pregnancy when advanced paternal age is a concern, that they should have preconception genetic counseling. They should be advised about the risks of infertility, miscarriage, de novo mutations associated with advanced paternal age. Um, they should offer um, prenatal di diagnosis up to 16 weeks of gestation, but interestingly, there are no recommendations for doing whole exome sequence that would really identify whether these gene defects are present. And this is because not only is it costly requiring the trios, the mother, the father, and, and DNA from the fetus, but also, um, you know, there could be genetic information about the parents with adult onset conditions that maybe, maybe they don't want to know. Um, and so um, right now, that is not part of the, the recommendations. So my take home message is that there are many well recognized causes of genetic um, and uh, well uh, recognized genetic and genomic causes of male infertility, even though they're not currently diagnosed. Certainly advanced paternal age is detrimental to many offspring. Many are born and normal, but uh, it is still a risk. And Certainly older men who wish to conceive a child should be better informed of the risks of the conditions that can occur in the offspring and that these, the risk increases over time. There's no screening or genetic tests that are um, specifically targeting um, advanced paternal age. And once a pregnancy is initiated, um, in largely the pregnancy is treated the same as any other. So thank you very much. And I know we're almost out of time, but if you have any quick questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks, Dory. That was 
great. Um, yeah, the, the, you know, the issue with advanced reproductive age is really a big hot topic in male reproduction right now. And thanks for sharing all that information for us. Just one question about the link between male infertility and testis cancer. Is there any crossover between uh, genetic abnormalities seen in testicular cancer and male reproduction? Because, you know, we think that there's some kind of dysgenesis syndrome that goes on between that and patients with undescended testes and testicular cancer. Is there any crossover between those two groups? So, so that's actually two questions, Stan. But um, so certainly, you know, um, there's a strong sense that some of the genes involved in testis cancer are the same ones that are responsible for poor sperm production in these men. And uh, um, right, because testis cancer is more common in the men with spermatogenic failure or varying degrees of that with low sperm production. Um, so there's certain commonalities there. Testis cancer, um, but there's a number of these cancers, prostate cancer, lung cancers. Um, there's a whole series of them. Some of these are, again, defects affecting sperm production that also affect, um, um, say, double strand break repair, single strand problems, mismatch repair. Um, problems, in general, problems with DNA repair can cause not only infertility, but but the development of malignancies. And because in the testis, you have the highest rate of proliferation in the body, you know, again, you're more predisposed to keep making these mistakes and, and, and um, the somatic cells are less good at having checkpoints to stop the damaged DNA from then causing, say, a malignancy as compared to in meiosis with the testis where you simply lose the germ cells. Um, so that was, Probably not a complete answer. Was that what you wanted, Stan? Well, I mean, do they have the 13, 14, 21 that you see in structural defects in infertility or no? Or are you aware of that? Or um, I'm just not completely sure which, what the crossover there is. Well, so, you know, for testis cancer on a molecular level, people are now starting to work on that in a bit more detail. But because testis cancer had a higher cure rate, um, right, um, if, if we go back to some of the old literature, right, when, when it was really a death sentence, and now the patients do tremendously better with treatment, um, they, um, um, there were less researchers working in that area. Um, that's changed a bit in recent years, so I think that you'll see more coming out of it, but, but essentially, um, um, Testis cancer is an obvious example of where there's a cancer syndrome related to, um, to the cause of why you have spermatogenic failure. But we know now that there's lots of other cancer syndromes as well related to um, uh, improper genomic um, stability that underlie both the infertility and the cancer development. But, but none of them are markers, Stan, with the exception of some of the DNA repair genes for both infertility and uh, malignancy. Dr. Liam, um, this is uh, Dan Kellner. Thank you so much for the talk today. I'm not sure if anyone else has questions. I think a lot of people are gonna be going to clinic in the OR now. Absolutely, absolutely. If you all have questions, um, you know, um, Stan or Sheila have my email, so I'd be happy to answer any, any of them. You know, if anybody has a question, they can just send it to me. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, and thank you so much uh, for inviting me. Uh, this was great. Hopefully next time I see you all in person, which would really be a lot nicer. So uh, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you.